very special occasion. It's the uh, last time that we'll be joined by the Honourable Member for Rosevears as he's intending to retire. Well, that was the, what he told me this morning. Uh, and uh, uh, we've had um, uh, a tribute to uh, the Honourable Member um, previously. And... Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to welcome uh, the Honourable Member's son, <coughs> excuse me, I've got um, Chucky, um, Adrian and uh, Kerry's granddaughters, Mila and Frankie, to the Leader's Reserve, because I couldn't use the President's Reserve. Uh, welcome to the Chamber. They are all very proud of their pop and they're uh, here to um, see Thank your you fine <laughs> contribution. So. Uh, so uh, the question is that the uh, chamber uh, does now, uh, the council does now adjourn. Ask to speak first, or him. Um, the honourable member for Murchison. Um, has... I might give the member for um, Rose Fears uh, a little bit of time to gather himself. Um, <laughs> I've seen this happen before, Mr. President. Yes. We need a moment to gather himself. It must have only been once. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just a very brief contribution um, on adjournment. Uh, to acknowledge the um, extraordinary service of Mr Kerry Finch, um, the member for Rosebears, independent member for Rosebears, to this place. Um, and I think we'll, the place will be, uh, a lot, it'll be a loss to this place. And when he retires and leaves us, um, we'll have a chance to talk more about that aspect when he has a bit of a roasting later on. <laughs> um, lucky enough to be participating in that. Um, but I, th I just wanted to wish him all the best. Um, it's um, a, a huge achievement. Um, 15... 18, 18 years, sorry. 18. 18, yeah, 18 years. I've been here 15. Sorry, 18 years. Um, and it is a long time. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, uh, the, the members' history in that perhaps later tonight. But it is an honour to have served with him. Um, I thank him for his friendship and his com camaraderie. Um, some of the pranks, yeah. Um, but we'll talk about some of those things later on. But I, I commend your commitment to um, doing the best um, at all times for your constituents, but also for the state of Tasmania. So um, all the best. Um, it's been a pleasure most of the time. <laughs> but we really do appreciate your commitment. I also wish him for uh, Hugh and the best in his upcoming election as well. It's always a stressful time. But I just want to wish the member for Rose who's all the very best in his retirement. We look forward to chatting more after the adjourn. Yeah, yeah. 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 Question is uh, that the council Yours. do now adjourn the honourable member for Windermere. Oh, Thank you, Mr. President. One couldn't let this occasion go by without uh, uh, identifying the great service that this man has given to this state uh, and to his electorate over the last 18 years, 18 <coughs> years plus a few months, in actual fact. So, um, has always been a great contributor in this place, has been extremely articulate. I've tried to follow him from time to time, but I haven't got anywhere near him and I'm not likely to be able to. Uh, I think a lot of his ABC background comes out in his contributions in this place too, Mr President. So I thank Kerry for the positive discussion you and I had a few days after I announced I was going to have a look at this place, in actual fact, and you mightn't recall it, but uh, we, we had a discussion in your office and uh, about things were happening here and what to expect and all of those things. So I thank you for that because it did help me moving forward. Uh, and, uh, Only I'd known. I haven't forgotten. <laughs> I haven't forgotten. <laughs> We've got you to thank. I don't, in, in, in just making uh, a few statements tonight, I don't want to give too much away, Mr President, because I will be speaking shortly uh, at another function, so I don't want to uh, pass on too much of that. But it's great to see Adrian here, great to see Kerry's grandchildren here as well. Welcome, grandchildren. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> well done. <laughs> great. So, and it's great to have family present, obviously, on an occasion like this. But, Kerry, you've been, um, as I said, a, a, a strong... You've been very strong in your presentations. And there were times when uh, you were on a high. Of course, it wasn't always a wise idea to interrupt you. <laughs> and I learned that very early in the piece, in fact. As a, as a learner in this place, Mr President, I had my learning plate still on. Uh, and I remember interrupting Kerry on one occasion when he was on a high uh, and was being fairly strong in his presentation. 
And he looked at me and he said, do you think you can do better? Will you come up here and do it? Words to that effect. <laughs> and it really, really set me back and I thought, nah, <laughs> what have I seen? What have I done? I think if it happened now, I might get up, but uh, <laughs> certainly not back then, not the those times. So, Kerry and I, and it's fair, we've had our differences in this place, uh, and I, I think we all do. But the one thing that we've been able to do, Mr President, is to put that behind us when we've walked out of here. And uh, we've retained, and I hope this is right, <laughs> we've retained a good relationship and a good friendship for a long, long time. And I'm going to miss that. I'm going to miss that. But... Uh, no doubt, uh, you know, you will be welcome back uh, to our place, at, uh, both in the offices at Launceston, uh, at any time, you, your family, all of your family, in actual fact, at any time, so, and, in fact, welcome to my home as well. Does that uh, mean he can keep his office? Pardon? <laughs> Does that mean he can keep his office? Yeah, yeah, yeah so, I think he intends to. But, I, you know, I, I, I said, I, I, Kerry has been a great, great contributor. There's been, been absolutely no doubt about that. And assistance to me, assistance to a lot of members in this place. So wonderful to, to know that. This is a time when it's got to be extremely emotional for Kerry. Um, you know, it's got to be a very difficult time for him as well. You know, he's putting behind him a large period of time when he has served or contributed to this state, yeah. even the ABC as well, another 18 years in this place, this, uh, or 18 plus years in this place. So you know, to all of a sudden find yourself moving into another area, out of that area, Mr President, mm. has got to be a huge challenge. But Kerry will lift, <coughs> Kerry will uh, enjoy a re long retirement, a good retirement, a healthy and happy retirement, and the same to Kerry's family, Carol and, uh, and uh, Kerry's family, whole family, uh, that they'll have a great time and enjoy life together. And I'm sure Brian's going to appreciate your retirement, Kerry. So thank you, congratulations for what you've done for this state and country. Yeah. 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 The question is that the council do now adjourn. The honourable member for Launceston. I think we've done this before, actually. I remember yeah, we, we actually yeah. did this back in May, but uh, obviously it, it's Kerry enough. Kerry planned that. Sorry? Kerry planned that. He yeah. did. Right. Two, two bites of the cherry. <laughs> but it is lovely to see your family here today and your grandchildren. And I'm quite sure, Kerry, you'll have some wonderful times now with your grandchildren now that uh, you have more time. And obviously Ivan, Kerry and I share an office in Launceston and, and we're sort of almost like a little bit of family there. We, we all, sometimes we argue, sometimes we get on, you know, it, it's just, it is a bit like a family. But I have to say one thing about you, Kerry, it doesn't matter if you ask some information or ask for help, you're always willing. And I think that's really great, you know, you know it's, it doesn't matter what time you are, always prepared to actually give some advice and give some information. And even, you know, the latest thing that we've been discussing, it's really good that you can ask Kerry about an issue that you might be dealing with or something you're looking at and you, you're never sort of too busy to, and you always take the time. And I think that's, that's something that is really nice. And I think it's nice about our relationship in Launceston that we do share an office. And as I said, we don't always vote the same. Sometimes we don't, we often don't agree. But it doesn't make any difference. And as Ivan said, when it's over, that's over, and you move on to your next issue and whatever. But I do enjoy Kerry's oration sometimes when he gets here and he thumps, <laughs> thumps the lectern, and it's it is it's a, and raises his voice. Well, he does, but but, he, but it's actually. It's actually good. Sometimes, you know, life in the chamber can be a little bit dull, but Kerry can actually bring a little bit of life to it, and uh, it is. The bit of theatrics is often quite good, and I think it, yeah, it is appreciated. So I'm not going to go on. I'm sure people want to make some comments, but it's lovely to see, you know, even some of your family here, and I'm not sure whether Carol's going to be overly delighted to have you <laughs> home all the time. Through, I'm, through you, Mr President, she might pack his lunch and send him off to work every I'm day sure anyway. she's very pleased <laughs> when... It comes to Hobart, and I always remember Greg Hall saying uh, the power that be there was always very pleased when he was actually heading to Hobart. Oh, <laughs> and I, the War Office. The war, oh, well, yes, the, the, the War Office. Well, the War Office was always glad to see him when Parliament was sitting to head down, and she knew where he was and what he was doing, and it's like my husband looks and says, I can see, I know you're in the chamber, I can see your legs. It's like, <laughs> so it's interesting that they actually do, some people do watch us oh, in public. People are sad, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty sad. When you're retired, you have such a life that you need to actually have a look at Parliament. Quite a few who do, actually. And see what you're you? doing. But look, you have made a great contribution, Kerry, and 18 years is wonderful. And I think the really nice thing is, you've decided yourself when you felt ready to leave. Mm. And I think that's really important. It's great that you've been able to stay as long as you wanted 
started and now, as you said to Annie earlier, you feel comfortable now, you've done everything you wanted to do and you're ready to leave and you won't have any regrets. I think that's really great and I wish you and the family and Carol, particularly Carol, all the best <laughs> to how it goes. But, uh, yeah, well done. Yeah. Thanks. The question is that the uh, council do now adjourn. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Rosevears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well... <laughs> you did eat a moment, didn't you? <laughs> It's going to be tougher than I thought. The kids here. Um, that's a real surprise. But great to share. Uh, but Mr. President, thank you and uh, fellow members for your kind words about me from several weeks ago, <laughs> and uh, and the reprise. And uh, I'm happy to have this opportunity for my final speech uh, face to face. Um, last year, I announced that I wouldn't stand for the 2020 election to give independents particularly the opportunity to establish their teams, to get out in the community, establish their credentials and have the best chance of being in the mix on election night, which, as we know now, is the 1st of August. Uh, I just felt it was time to bring a, a fresh face, you'd all appreciate that, and, <laughs> and fresh energy uh, into the chamber, and the right time for me too, after 18 years, to move on to the next phase of my professional life. I'm, I'm not thinking of it as retirement. Uh, I commend also to all the candidates uh, on the way in which they've had to deal with this interruption caused by the COVID-19 global health pandemic. It, it must have been very, very frustrating for them during this time. My best wishes, of course, go to my successor, and I trust that person's journey will be as enjoyable as mine. And, of course, the best wishes to the member for Hewan in uh, his campaign to return. So after a, a little over 18 years, I'm the longest serving current Member of Parliament, uh, referred to as the father of the Parliament. And uh, I was asked whether there was ever a mother of Parliament. And uh, I said, well, just stay tuned. There has been one in the British Parliament. Um, but I'll talk more about uh, women in Parliament later. But whilst I've become known for my uh, current role and my media career, so much of who I am can be shared at home to pretty humble beginnings in Ferntree on Kanani, Mount Wellington. What would those people of my childhood, let alone mum and dad, think of me being portrayed here as number <laughs> 725 <laughs> in, in the long room? Unbelievable. An honour. I was the youngest of six children, and life growing up might have been viewed as not easy by outsiders. Um, my dad, Clive, served in the Navy for 12 years from 1932, the Depression years, through the Second World War, returned home in 1945, damaged, as were many, and we lived with that reality as a family. Um, those challenges, I think, add to your strengths, uh, your resilience, your understanding that hurdles can be overcome. Uh, Mum Beryl, Joe as we called her, was able to forge a family life for us in spite of adversity. But life was like that for baby boomers and their parents. We weren't Robinson Crusoes. Interestingly, growing up in Tasmania at that time gave me a sense that I could be whatever I wanted to be. Isn't that interesting? I always felt that if I wanted to be the Prime Minister of Australia, I could do that. It was up to me. 
And that would be a mindset that I would like to instill into every young Tasmanian. I clearly remember, as a 13 or 14 year old, not concerning myself with ambition in any way, but wanting just to be a personal success. I wanted to be happy about who I am. And I, that would have been the reason why I was hired for my first job at 7HT. Bruce Klein, when I was departing after five years to travel and broaden my horizons, said to me, he said, you know, Kerry, when you applied here, there were 40 people applied for this job. Did you know that? And I said, no, I didn't. And he said, you know what made you stand out? And I said, no. He said, you were the only one without ambition. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? But I think it was because I would have said what I've just told you. When you've got a 15-year-old saying to you, you know, what do you want to be? And I say, well, I just want to be a personal success. I just want to be happy with me. So anyway, I'll talk more about 7HT soon, but I uh, followed in the footsteps of uh, Errol Flynn by going to Macquarie Street Primary School, passing the ability test, as it was then, and going on to Hobart High School. The headmaster was C. Dwight Brown. He was a wonderful educator. And when he came to an agreement with me that I should leave the school, <laughs> he, <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, it's between you and me, Kerry, and I like it here. <laughs> Um, but he told me that he was at Hobart High with Errol Flynn when he was expelled at 15 for dropping two eggs from the landing of the quadrangle onto the headmaster's lectern <laughs> below as he was conducting an assembly. Oh, and that was... That, no, no, I didn't emulate that. But that was the final straw for uh, Errol Flynn. So here I am at 15, down to the CES, for the offer of three jobs, one which was a control operator at 7HT Hobart. And I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll take that job till something better comes up. And I wasn't, I wasn't cocky or anything, that was just the way it was. Then, jobs were not an issue for young people in the early 60s. My mates, you know, we were leaving school and uh, just getting jobs straight away. But not something, of course, that you recommended, you recommend for today's youngsters. And very pleased, all three boys all made it through to uh, year 12 with our encouragement and on to university. My early mentor at 7HT was Barry Ferber, an excellent broadcaster. He ran an announcing school. And he instructed me, don't try to be anybody else. Don't try to be something that you're not. It was good advice. Another lesson that has served me well, particularly when I nominated to stand for Rosevears, was reinforced at my first gathering of my team of friends who had gathered all from all walks of life and all political persuasions, just friends to come and be my team. Two came out of the woodwork to offer help. Journalist Mike Howe, who I've mentioned in the House, he'd retired from the ABC, and Phil Martin, who at that time was Head of News and Current Affairs at SBS Television, based in Sydney. And he flew down for that first meeting. And when I sought advice from the gathering, because I was really a novice, I was not a student of politics. Both of those gentlemen said, be yourself. Just be yourself. And that helped to relax me. Because then I thought, well, yep, I can, I can do that. Because I'm not going to try to be somebody else. History shows that I was elected in 2002, ahead of eight other candidates. So the new learning curve begins. And I didn't really see myself as a politician, just more as a parliamentarian and a representative of the people of Rosevears. As an independent, I could keep an open mind on issues until I heard all the arguments. There's no point in making up your mind until you've heard all the facts and the ramifications.
And if you lock yourself into a position, whether you do it through the media or publicly, you won't hear from those people or give the others in your electorate who have a contrary position to express themselves to you. You've got to give them that chance. The big issue which began not long after my election was, of course, the pulp mill. It was to pervade my career for the next 10 or 12 years. I was not opposed entirely to a pulp mill in Tasmania. Closed loop, chlorine free, that's got a pretty good ring to it. Rather, I was opposed initially to the government and guns moving away from the RPDC process and bringing it here through Parliament. And then, of course, the issue of the location in the Tamer Valley. Do a plan B, put it at Hampshire, was my mantra. At one stage, I delivered the largest petition ever presented to the Tasmanian Parliament of people opposed to the location. 21,360. Whatever you do, don't try to beat it because the staff have to count and verify every signator. That would have been before e-petitions too. That would have been before e-petitions. Quite a job, absolutely. It was a big job. David, uh, our clerk, is shuddering <laughs> at, the, at the memory of it. Having a flashback. As a follow-on later, we, of course, spent four years on the Tasmanian Forest Agreement, which attempted to draw together all the players in the forestry industry. Some of you will, will remember the part of the debate when the member for Hewan moved a motion to send the result off to a committee. <laughs> and I was sitting over there, I had had an absolute gutful of the issue. So divisive for our Tasmanian community. And I spoke vociferously against the motion. And I was very lucky because I was sitting there, steam coming out of my ears. And just luckily, the member for Mersey got the call. He was the first to speak, and it gave me a chance to stop my heart beating out of my chest. <laughs> and when I got up, I, uh, uh, I still was vociferous, but uh, it helped to calm me down a modicum. But um, it was interesting because I've said during that short, sharp speech that if, uh, if the committee gets up, I won't be on it. Well, it got up, <laughs> and, and, I, and I had a break. The coming January, while everyone else went through, went through that political process. But it was a very, that was a very strange process for me to be at home, knowing that there was uh, work to be done. But suffice to say that we don't have a pulp mill, and we have a restructured forestry industry, which offers a different future. Uh, in 2006, we had the Beaconsfield Mine Rock Fall, when uh, Larry Knight died and Todd Russell and Brant Webb were rescued. That uh, unfortunate event put Beaconsfield on the map around the world, particularly for the stoicism of the mine people and the community, and has resulted in the magnificent museum at Beaky as a tribute to the mining in the area and that event. And as we've recently heard, could be mined again. Good. The allure of gold, eh? <laughs> One of the special debates here was the same-sex marriage bill in 2012, 2013, and I was happy to stand up for the principles of tolerance and a fair go. Social justice has been a very big theme of my work here, with support for the Civil Relationships Bill 10 years ago, anti-discrimination, expungement of criminal records and support for gender diversity. For me, no-brainers. My election in 2014 against a candidate who strongly opposed the bill, the, ma the marriage bill, showed that people of Rosevears and Tasmania agree with those values. 2014 was 
a demanding but very interesting campaign. One of the reasons was that my opponent signalled a challenge in November. So it was a long campaign. So Carol and I put together a letter for distribution. We wanted that distributed to as many households as possible. We printed, folded 15,000 of those and we personally delivered 10,000 door to door. And uh, I posted on social media, some of you may have seen it, a photo of my shoes that I wore during that campaign and, uh, and the holes were right through the soles of, uh, of those shoes. But uh, it was a bit of a badge, it was good. As was mentioned at the declaration, I won the pre-polling votes, the postal votes, and every booth in the electorate. Even Agfest, <laughs> where all the heavies of the opposing party person were on display. I've always been supportive of the Indigenous community and reconciliation. There are strong recollections for me of the Cape Barren handover one of Jim Bacon's visions and fulfilled by Paul Lennon, the chairing the inquiry into the handover of Larapuna and Rebecca Creek was an honour and was always going to be difficult and that's the way it worked out. And then there was my desire to rename my electorate Kanamaluka. What a good name. That's the Palawakani name for the Tamer Estuary which covers the length of my electorate from Launceston to Bass Strait. So, unsuccessful and very disappointing for me. Rosevears is simply a hamlet where the Rebecca was built, where Batman and Faulkner took off to found Melbourne. Historic moment. But people think I live at Rosevears. People think I represent the people who live in Rosevears. Just Rosevears itself. <laughs> so it's, um, it's a little source of frustration, I think, and uh, that Kanamaluka uh, would have been symbolic and uh, would have been a terrific name. Easy to say, easy to spell. Uh, I've presented speeches here and I recently gave my take on Uluru, Statement from the Heart, and the line that resonates with me, don't think about losing... 200 years of your history, think about sharing 60,000 years of our history. Well, we're moving slowly towards reconciliation, but out of little things, big things grow. There was the sadness of Vanessa Goodwin's passing. I remember calling on her when I wanted to discuss uh, elder abuse. She made the trip to Launceston as Attorney General to meet some of my constituents and we had a long conversation about that. Another time we had problems with Wombat Mange in Arontapu uh, on the West Hamer. She came to investigate, spent half a day with us and secured a grant for the people at Kelso who were working on the issue. And Vanessa herself, as you know, worked quietly on issues, not banging the drum, or pumping up her own tyres. There's a raft of words to describe the type of person she was. We know the quality she had. She was an exemplar for the work that we do and the type of people that we need in Parliament to set an example of how we should conduct ourselves. We are very low in the trust levels when assessed by the public. Don Wing and I reminisced recently about how special she was to work with and recalled our trips to investigate our select committee inquiry into tourism. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh though you may. <laughs> she was wonderful company, particularly on the trip to New Zealand, which I might add was very fruitful to our report. It was, <laughs> it was, no, it was no junket. We had terrific access to uh, the, the uh, bureaucrats, the tourism bureaucrats in New Zealand. Uh, you know, who, who reported to the then Minister for Tourism, who was their Prime Minister. And uh, a lot of the things that we, recommendation we put in place have come to be. 
Uh, one particular mem uh, memory was being in Wellington at the same time as Australia's first female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. Vanessa found out where she was staying and she was excited. She wanted to catch a glimpse of her as she returned from the New Zealand Parliament. So there we were, Vanessa, Don and myself, <laughs> we were like three groupies. <laughs> we're, we're sitting on a bench waiting for her car to arrive. It did. We just saw her go into the hotel and it was too quick <laughs> for us to call out to her. You know, we missed a really great moment. There would have been a great chat. But Vanessa was happy just to see her. With the uh, very human and down-to-earth way she conducted herself, Vanessa set the bar very high. We'll not always reach the Vanessa bar, but it's a good thing to strive for. Now, my parliamentary mentor, Don Wing. What an independent exemplar he was. He was the president here for six years from when I first arrived. And I recall his frustration during those six years at not being able to represent his electorate fully on the floor of the chamber. And how, when he decided to relinquish the position, he spent the next three years doing exactly that as a wonderful independent. And with that lawyer's mind and the experience that he had in his kit bag, it was just wonderful to watch. A great example to us. Now that Don has gone from the chamber, and I'm about to go, I think it's pretty safe to tell the story of a very special night here. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> featuring the Scottish group Fiddler's Bid oh, and the former treasurer, David Crean. The six-piece Fiddler's Bid from the Shetland Islands were in Tasmania for 10 days on the island and staying at Rest Point. Don stayed there too. And in the lift, he met them, invited them to come to Parliament House the next night for dinner and bring your instruments. <laughs> <laughs> so most of us gathered in the dining room and not only were we entertained by them, but also a good old country song or two by David Crean. <laughs> he loved entertaining, he loved an audience. Well, we adjourned to the President's rooms, but because David had access to this chamber, in we all came. <laughs> Fiddler's bid, gathered up there. <laughs> Clark's still here. <laughs> <laughs> and he's listening. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some ideas, folks. <laughs> and they played their traditional Shetland fiddle tunes whilst we relaxed and soaked up the atmosphere <laughs> that this theatre provided. We behaved. It was just... Well, imagine how stunning it was. I think the lights were taken down a bit. And then th that music wafting through this chamber was out of this world. They were absolutely world-class entertainers, but very unassuming, wonderful company. Well, the celebration, of course, didn't continue here. It continued back in the rooms, and it was really quite hilarious when the next morning, the usher of the Black Rod, <laughs> we're standing here, still all with a glow on about the wonderful night that we'd had, and the usher of the Black Rod stood at the door and said, Honourable Members, the Deputy President. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we were all left wondering what, what fate might have befallen our beloved host. <laughs> uh, but he has assured me time and time again that it was a faulty alarm clock back, <laughs> back in his bedroom. But uh, as I say, that music was out of this world and uh, music that subsequently was heard all over the world. Now, there has been so much committee work to detail here, which I won't do, but one highlight for me was as chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Community Development 
When the member for Murchison initiated those uh, government administration committees, much to her credit, there was often a reference to the problems of combining the two houses for committee work. But I can say to you that it was not a problem for me as chair of the Community Development Committee. Even when at one stage I had Cassie O'Connor, Brett Whiteley and Brenton Best as members of that I was committee. There then too. So what a mix. <laughs> but they were terrific to, in that setting and they were productive. We were productive as a, as a committee. But that's not decrying what we have now and I appreciate the committee's committee work that we do. I never objected, I never spoke against it. I just was happy to move on and give the new committee work a try. And uh, I, it's worked. Another would be my select committee inquiry with Don Wing and the member for Windermere into the statutory management authority for the Tamer Estuary and catchments. It didn't get traction then, but it's been put under the spotlight lately. It's still being referred to. It yep. Is. But uh, suffice to say, a lot of committee work, always enjoyable, and albeit at times challenging. You know? Finding your way there. Sorry? Finding your way to hearings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the problems. <laughs> um, constituent work has always been a high priority for me. Medicinal cannabis, uh, palliative care, Wombat Mange, West Hamer Highway safety, and safety generally, you know, the, the highway safety, but safety generally. Uh, I've always been a passionate supporter of the tourism industry, the health of the Tasmanian Devils, the Deviant Landslip issue has been close to home, and of course I strongly support the arts community, uh, education in all its facets, and my connection with the Sporting Club for People with Disabilities, New Horizons, has been a very important part of my parliamentary and personal life. The Commonwealth Parliamentary Association has always been prominent in my thinking of the enhancement of our roles here, whether promoting, being on the executive, or representing the Tasmanian Parliament in Australia and overseas. The highlight, of course, being that wonderful trip to Westminster for the 100th celebration of the CPA. The theme was Women as Agents of Change, and I presented a speech with that title at the conference. And we had a slow start to female representation in Tasmania after Dame Enid Lyons went to federal parliament in 1943. Two women, Amelia Best and Mabel Miller, were elected to the House of Assembly in 1955. And we now elect women to all tiers of government as a matter of course. And I'm very proud of the fact that we were the first parliament in Australia to have over 50% of female representation. <laughs> Voters of both genders trust women candidates now, and we must encourage women into politics and elsewhere in the Tasmanian community where important decisions are made. And it's worth noting too that of the six candidates for Rosevears, four are women. Improving public health has been a focus, and I particularly enjoyed supporting Gary Fetke, Dr Gary Fetke, and his concern about our intake of sugar uh, through his website, No Fructose. Low-carb, high-fat diet. That was his, uh, his push. Get into it. Way to go. Agreed, Mr President? Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, thanks must go to the many sporting clubs that have included me as a board member, supporter, patron and spectator. The Launceston Football Club, Launceston Little Athletics, the Tornadoes, Bridge North Football Club, the Three Peaks Race, the Birralee and Districts Ponies Club and so many more. Another momentous development in Rosevears was the Beaconsfield Child and Family Centre. We were the beneficiaries of being the first in Australia and it's been a huge success story for us. I was pleased to be involved on the committee almost from the get-go 
I came on board when we missed out on the mine disaster money and the committee was able to then convince the Federal Labor Government of its need. And as I say, the first in Australia and uh, to go there now and witness what's being achieved is just wonderful for our community. Being a representative of the community has given me some great opportunities in promoting our talented people. Most notably, this was achieved through the Tasmanian Talent Team, which comprised Don Wing, the indefatigable Susie Clark, Di Bucknell, my EA at that time, and myself. We sent Di Briffer, Don De Jong, Tom Ward and Ben Austin to the World Expo in Japan 15 years ago. And then assisted pianist Ben Austin, out of this world, remarkable pianist, countertenor Nick Tolpert, just the most incredible voice you will ever hear. And we help them with their individual music careers. Sports people include boxer and world champion Daniel Gill and Commonwealth Games weightlifter Jenna Myers. And through the Exeter RSL Community and Sports Club, mm. with me as patron, we've assisted a lot of promising young sports people to travel around Australia for competitions. Last year was made very special for me with my appointment as the parliamentary representative on the Frank McDonald Memorial Prize, which is a wonderful involvement with the RSL and the Education Department taking six grade nine students to the Western Front in Belgium and France to embrace the history of the First World War, Australia's contribution and the aftermath. And one thing from that trip, and there were many, many things to remember, but one thing that stood out in my mind was that first day of the Battle of the Somme. British troops suffered 57,470 casualties and there were 19,240 killed. 37 sets of brothers died. That day, day one, one day. terrible. Those six young people, the two teachers, our RSL rep, our leader, and our guide were of the highest order and will be forever in our collective thoughts. I must also highlight the honour I've had to organise and be the guest speaker at the Anzac Day ceremonies at the Exeter RSL for about the last 15 years, could even be longer. Thanks to President Arthur Kingston and his committee for allowing me to do that. And I very much enjoyed coaching the leadership group at Exeter High in public speaking to be our junior guest speakers each year at Exeter and Beaconsfield for Anzac Day, the dawn and the 11 o'clock services. <clears throat> One point I must make too, just coming back here to Parliament, is the benefit of electorate tours. Um, they've gone off the radar a bit lately, but I've always found those tours most beneficial in broadening our understanding of what's occurring in other members' electorates around Tasmania. I would encourage, again, members who have not organised one to find out how it's achieved and it will pay immense dividends for you in your community connection. Those with experience, particularly the member for Murchison, the member for McIntyre, they've organised a couple apiece. Mm. I've had three now. Three. <laughs> Greedy. <laughs> they know how it works. <laughs> and I couldn't pass this opportunity, Mr President, without reflecting on the special interest speeches. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to get there some, but I might. <laughs> but when I first came here, um, I looked to see where I could project my electorate my special people and myself into the chamber. And I felt the obvious one was through the special interest speeches. Since I started on them, uh, I've only missed one in 18 years. <laughs> and that was the day of my heart attack. And I had to phone the member for Hobart. <laughs> 
to not only present my speech, but also to host the family who travelled south for it <laughs> to lunch. <laughs> and uh, I might say it was Michael Booth of Riverside. Yep. You might remember. Um, he was the first Tasmanian to run a marathon on the seven continents of the world, including Antarctica, and it was to promote organ and tissue donations as a tribute to his daughter, Alison. Um, and I'm so pleased that others now have recognised the value of the special interest speeches and supported that increase of presentations from four to six, of course, nearly always full now. And I just think, as I, well, I record mine, as you know, and post them on, uh, on social media and to the people that I talk about, and I just think it's a, a great way to promote the more human side of the work that we do here in the Legislative Council and to salute our electorates and our people. I'm going to wrap up now, Mr President. If you're not, you can... First, by repeating what Don Wing said here on his departure. It has been an honour to be part of the Legislative Council family. Thanks to my friends from all walks of life and political persuasions who supported me during my campaigns in 2002, 2008 and 2014. We're coming together on election night 2020 to reminisce. When I was first elected, Tasma Howell guided me, but only for a short time. She came from a time when she was the EA for six Northern members. Then it was 0.6 of an FTE in 2002, and over time it was increased to one FTE, and that was a blessing for us all. Uh, Diane Bucknell was with me uh, until 2014, a good friend. Then I've been lucky to have Susie Simon Crawford as my EA. And thank, thank you to those for running my office so brilliantly, as I would like it to be run as friendly and warm. I've had uh, tremendous assistance from my very special friend, Mike Howe, and his daughter described him at his service recently as the erudite intellectual. He was terrific. Jim Anderson, the esteemed Launceston lawyer, was a guiding light with his wife, Money, until a couple of years ago, and thanks to my technical supporter, Ross Crawford. And this is where it gets hard by mentioning names and worrying about leaving someone out inadvertently. Sufficient, I hope, to thank our unflappable and solid clerk, David Pearce, and all the excellent staff that you have with you, David, who support us so generously with their friendship, their courtesy, support, care and management during our time here. Our Hansard people, who will be relieved of the duty of chasing up my quotes. <laughs> the library and research staff, always on call with the best, the timely and accurate information. The catering staff, both in the dining room and the bistro, with the, the legendary Mandy Donnelly at the helm. And our often unsung heroes downstairs, at, uh, in the IT department with Peter Hancocks. Always helpful. Uh, during my time, there have been four outstanding presidents, each with their own skills, knowledge and passion for the job. Don Wing, Sue Smith, our first female president, our all-round good bloke, Jim Wilkinson, and, of course, our gregarious Craig Farrell notably the first president from a political party. That's a feather in your cap, sir. To my constituents of Rosevears, thank you for trusting the novice who put his hand up in 2002 and enabling me to grow as a community representative in state parliament. I've always felt welcomed, safe and accepted for what I've tried to achieve for the betterment of your lives in Rosevears, in our special part of Tassie, the West Tamer, and for Tasmania generally. 
the future? Well, it's about Carol. I'm going to be her carer. It is her time. I've said to you, and uh, I've started practising it <laughs> <laughs> during, the, during the pandemic, that I've turned my life over to her. Her call is what I do. She has uh, given me that opportunity to have a lot of freedom during my media and political career. I've never had a handbrake. And uh, now it's my time to give to her and the family, Brian, Adrian and David, and more quality time with my grandchildren. We've got uh, four now and one more on the way, <laughs> up on the Sunshine Coast. These two champions won their cross country oh, yesterday. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty proud. <laughs> Don't you forget it. So we've got that to share. We'll be sharing a lot of little athletics with the kids, as we have done over the past couple of years. Um, shoring up my superannuation <laughs> is going to be uh, an issue with our property development in West Launceston to stop us being a drain on the public purse, of course. And uh, that's taken 10 long, hard years. If we want to talk about planning far out, the hurdles and the hoops, you know it's been a long journey, but we've had a breakthrough and we're ready to proceed with that timely because I can take that on. And of course, reflecting on the enriched life in Tasmania, uh, that Tasmania, Tasmanians and its people have given me. So thank you for that and thanks colleagues. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure we um, all pass on our best wishes to you, Kerry, for, for your retirement. And, uh, and thank you very much for the work that you've done uh, for the people of Rosevears and the Parliament of Tasmania. You've been a a tremendous member. It's going to be very, very odd uh, the next Tuesday that we have, yes. and there'll be no special interest from the Honourable Kerry Finch. <laughs> uh, it's going to take uh, some time to get used to that, but uh, I'm sure we'll keep that going, and every time we have a special interest uh, matter, people will think of you and we'll miss the thank you very much, uh, Mr President, uh, delivered so beautifully.